have an amazing panel discussion on the customer experience transformation pulse of every business right now. So this panel discussion will be covering a lot of interesting topics, which includes how can companies develop a deeper level of customer empathy in the post COVID era, leveraging voice of customer survey data to reduce digital CX friction and create a cohesive end to end experience, experience transformation through better customer experience management, how can an organization deliver customer delight through user experience design? Well, joining us now on the screen is our esteemed set of panelists. We have Michelle Huff, who is the Chief Marketing Officer from User Testing. Uh, Michelle Huff has 20 years experience leading marketing and go-to-market strategies at high-tech companies. Huff is responsible for user testing's go-to-market strategy, building the brand and generating demand. Thank you, Michelle, for joining us. Joining us on the screen is Dan, Dan uh, Ramirez, who's heading the business excellence uh, at Insular Life Assurance Company. So Dan is currently leading transformation efforts for a 111-year-old life insurance company. He firmly believes that the key to any successful transformation venture is starting with culture. By thinking in terms of becoming future ready, he keeps the organization's door open to future innovation. Thank you, Dan, for joining us today. So also joining us now is Kaushik Bhattacharji, who is the Head of Service Excellence at Medcare Hospitals. So Kaushik comes with 22 years of rich experience and associated with some of the finest brands like Taj Hotels, Marriott, ITC Hotels. He has been conferred with prestigious Bharat Gaurav Award in 2017 by Central Ministry. I welcome you, Kaushik, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Satan. Thank, thank you. So joining us now is uh, Devi Pranovo, who is the AVP of Customer Experience, Tokopedia. So Devi is the AVP of Customer Experience at Tokopedia. She was previously a software engineer at BlackBerry in Seattle, US. So Devi believes that technology is an enabler and a connector for everyone located mm -hmm. everywhere. Thank you, Devi, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So uh, we have Ainul, who is a general manager, customer advocacy from Domino's, who will be moderating this awesome, wonderful panel discussion. So Ainul is a versatile telecommunications professional with more than 20 years of work experience, primarily in customer experience, marketing, change management, project management, customer analytics, learning, and capability development. Thank you, Ainul, for joining us. So with this, ladies and gentlemen, we have all the panelists on the screen. I request the audience to use uh, the Q&A section. So, you know, to, you can post your questions and the speakers will be, the speakers will pick up the questions if time allows. So with this, I know the stage is all yours with your panel, over to you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Shruti. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be hosting such an esteemed panelist ranging from various industries in this session. From financial services, we have a representative from insurance, healthcare, e-commerce from Indonesia, consumer research, Michelle, and of course, myself from FMB Industry Dominoes. Okay, um, let me start with a, a quick opening narrative here. Um, as we see, the past two years, we we noticed change was the only constant thing over the past two years, right? Radical lifestyle shifts due to the pandemic have motivated consumers to take stock and make intentional and mindful decision in their life decision, be it financially, career-wise, buying or consumption. So the COVID-19 have triggered consumer to make um, what you would call the great life refresh, right? Resulting in drastic personal changes and reboot of their values, lifestyle and goals. So my question to the panel is, how have the pandemic situation for the past two years affected how your industry or your business serve your customers? For example, how your industry or your company per se have pivoted into, for example, new business model or new technology to be able to serve your customers better? I would like to pose the first question to my esteemed panelist, Michelle, if you could start off the discussion. Yes. Hi. Thanks for for having me. So you know, I, maybe to share more of a, what I think might be an interesting perspective. Um, I work um, in enterprise SaaS, 
Um, but one of the things that user testing does is, is help companies understand the perspective of their customers and understand kind of their needs and see the experiences through their point of view. And so what was interesting for us over the past few years was you know, obviously seeing it from our own business standpoint, but seeing what all the organizations worldwide had, had really been going through. And, um, you know, I'd say that that kind of our customer base fell into to kind of two camps. Um, it was interesting even seeing people in the same um, industries react differently. And there was um, kind of some companies that um, really hunkered down, right, and kind of braced themselves for what was coming, um, you know, there's definitely impacts of how they were using software and doing things to just really make sure they can make it through. Um, and then we saw other companies that almost doubled down. Um, there were people who were customers of ours who maybe were more focused on getting feedback from customers on maybe usability or optimizing certain channels. And then suddenly there were some of them that were having weekly meetings with the CEO who were trying to help um, the, the CEO understand when would people feel comfortable traveling again? And if they did, like what would they actually need to have um, to feel comfortable? And, and so all these dramatic changes, all the data that they had didn't really tell them how people were presently feeling and how they were going to be behaving. And so, um, you know, it, it kind of really changed the dynamic of of what people were getting feedback on. And we even saw a few of our customers really um, change their business model. We saw a lot more acceleration of digital experiences. And then also some people pivot and really leverage a lot of the feedback they were seeing to kind of change and create new revenue streams um, instead of trying to stay with their same kind of business model. So it was kind of interesting to see it's just even like in the same industry, how different organizations would behave um, but obviously, as, as a software provider, you know, having all of that like impacted um, us, but, uh, you know, it's a, a good place to to kind of be where people were really trying to understand consumers um, and their behaviors and and which is good. That's great. I, I guess uh, coming from your viewpoint, I guess you get to see how the different companies and different industry actually uh, read. Uh, respond to the pandemic and basically in terms of you were saying uh, obviously changing of business model and actually putting more emphasis on listening to the customer voice uh, and actually adapting or responding to that voice right the for example in Domino's if I can share um, uh, we saw um, a lot of um, uh, change. We have pivoted our business to uh, support the um, uh, social distancing. So we've introduced, for example, um, a, a service curbside pickup so that customer don't really have to go into the shop to actually pick up their pizzas, for example. They, they are met with the orders at the, at the entrance of the outlet, for example. So those are some of the things that we have done, uh, small things, but to pivot and, of course, to ramp up on our digital channel. So, yeah, it's great to see the yeah. whole industry also responding uh, to the whole pandemic situation. Okay, thank yeah, you. We had some people... Um, Similar, they were creating these mobile pickup experiences and they were doing it in such an accelerated time frame. <laughs> and they were like, I don't know what we're doing. And so they, they were they were going through and and um and actually having people um, provide feedback on what the experience looks like today to see if they could even like what does when they pull up to the parking lot, like like can they find actually like does the digital experience actually accurately provide the right direction? And so you know, it feels right. like at different times you would have had maybe longer time to kind of smooth that yes. out. <laughs> it makes all this like massive kind of pressure. Exactly. It's like the, 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 the take up or, or adoption of digital suddenly get accelerated like five, seven times to even 10 times, right? During the pandemic. So uh, like we see the communication or the interaction with the customer to the business are moving predominantly from offline to online during the pandemic. So and then they got used to that kind of shift and then even after when we are going towards the endemic now even after that they would expect the same level of experience to continue correct yeah because they've gotten comfortable with the digital experience i don't buy i don't go shop at the groceries anymore i, I shop online for my groceries for example you know that is one okay. of the yeah significant shift okay thank you thank you for that maybe we could get um from a perspective of um someone in the medical or healthcare industry maybe we could get your perspective uh Kaushik? 
on how the past two years have affected your industry? I think, I think uh, hi, good morning, everyone. And healthcare uh, comes with a lot of complexity because even you want to go for online channels, but there is a certain type of interaction that the doctor needs to have with the patient and not everything could move completely to online. So I think uh, the, the, the area that I operate from is Dubai and we declared the pandemic on 27th and believe you me, we were trying to launch a service known as the Telemedcare, which is our telemedicine. We were trying to launch it for last one year. For some reason or the other, we could not do. Mm -hmm. We had the pandemic on 27th. On 1st, uh, I think April, we went live on telemedicine with whatever we had. So I think what CIOs could not do, the pandemic did. So ultimately, mm -hmm. we started with telemedicine. At that point of time, telemedicine was not even approved by insurance. Now, what we started doing, we said at this point of time, it is more about reaching to the community. See, because in healthcare, you also have a responsibility towards the society. You have a responsibility towards your patient. The first thing that we started doing for first one month, we did not even charge anything from anyone because there is no way that people could pay money. Your payment gateways were not ready. It was not approved by insurance. We just released a number where people could dial in, could speak to a doctor. When we started doing this, the second important thing that started happening is people who are suffering from chronic diseases. We all know today blood pressure, diabetes management, high cholesterol management. This is a part and parcel of every family. And what was happening was because of this pandemic, they wanted their medicine to be refilled after every three months and they were not in a position to reach to the doctor. We said, okay, let we got our entire database of people who regularly buy medicines from us as per the disease management program. We started proactively contacting all of them, organizing a free consultation, asking them how they were feeling now, what were the requirement of the medications, and then our pharmacy model, which we had, which was always typically a counter model, now started delivering medicine at the footsteps. So these are the two major changes that we did and what ultimately happened because of this, you started gaining the market, you know, the market trust because this was a brand that supported you when you really needed the most. So when slowly in Dubai, obviously everything ended pretty quickly and things came back to normal, we saw a huge surge in our OP volumes. We saw a surge in our IP volumes, primarily because these customers came back to us because they, when they needed us, they didn't even have to come to us, we went to them. And yeah. one huge thing that happened, we made one of our hospitals completely COVID free. Because remember in this COVID era, they were also expecting mothers. The fear was expecting mother could not have caught a COVID. So what we did, we made one of our hospital, we worked with the government and said this will be a COVID free hospital, which was our mother and child hospital. So every expecting lady, in that four months in Dubai, used to come to our hospital to deliver in a COVID-free environment. So multiple approaches taken together in one umbrella, just at that point of time, did not look at an EBITDA, did not look at profitability, looked at one thing, how do we serve the nation? And I think that brought a huge perspective in terms of what we did during the COVID. Oh, that, that, that was really uh, commendable. I mean, what you guys have done. I mean, yes, um, there's a lot of research saying that the way the business or any industry, any business, the way they react during the pandemic in terms of the way they show empathy during the pandemic have created loyalty in the long run with the consumer. So what you have done is a testament to that, you know, yeah, like you said, you created this telemedicine without even thinking about how you're planning to charge the customer, right? It's just a matter of a community service that you provide to the community at hand because they are in the times of need. So looking beyond the profit per se, but looking to deliver the, the value to the customer, to the consumer without ever you know, looking at the PNL in a way, but in the end, it works out for you guys because the, you've earned the customer relationship long term. So, like you said, your OP traffic increased even after the pandemic, right? So, 
yeah, that's great. Congratulations to MedHealth. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that perspective. Okay. Um, I'd like to call upon um, uh, Davy. Davy, from an e commerce perspective in Indonesia, how have you pivoted the business during the course of the pandemic? Yeah, I think as a marketplace, we are lucky uh, that the pandemic actually bring us to a different level. Uh, we saw more and more people buying their essential needs online. As you mentioned earlier, also you start buying your groceries online, right? Uh, we see this across all different uh, product categories. Uh, as you know, there are limitations of physical interaction due to social distancing. So uh, we use this momentum to engage with more customers. So for example, we have special promotions for new buyers. And also uh, a lot of merchants started to onboard to our platform uh, where they previously sell things in a store. Uh, now they want to start selling their products online. So we help them, uh, nurture them and educate them on how they can open their online stores. Um, other than that, I think uh, with COVID, we also have a lot of uh, new buyers. Um, the expectation also increases uh, because uh, now if things are not available uh, online quickly, then people will start to get emotionally worried. So when there's also when there's complaint coming to us, we need to act really fast as well. So for example, uh, before COVID, if a customer order and it doesn't come yet, they can just go to the offline store and buy the stuff. But now uh, they will keep asking, when is my package coming? When is my package coming? And um, that's the only way they can survive through online. So we really need to act fast. Now. Okay, that's very interesting point. So basically, uh, is that the reason why you, uh, uh, Tokopedia actually uh, com uh, united or partnership with Gojek? to be able to combine the logistic part of the delivery of the product that is on Tokopedia. I understand you did that collaboration in 2021 during the COVID period itself, correct? Actually, um, Tokopedia as a company, we always collaborated with many, many uh, logistic partners and mm -hmm. Gojek itself has been our partner since 2015, okay. where we collaborated and Gojek drivers become one of the logistic uh, options in Tokopedia. But I think uh, the merger that happened last year uh, strengthened our relationship further. We have a lot closer collaborations in terms of uh, financial business, uh, financial technology, payments, uh, loyalty. So all customers within each platform can uh, have the same like loyalty programs. That's okay. one example. Yeah. So it, 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 it cut across beyond logistic, basically, you're seeing the merger. Correct. Yes. All right. Okay. All right. Interesting. All right. Thank you. Okay. So um, now if we could move on to the next uh, topic that we wanted to discuss during this session is um, how consumer expectation uh, have changed um, post the pandemic, right? So customers are engaging more uh, onto the digital platform for one, and how brands must orchestrate a compelling omni-channel journey for consumers and uh, lead an account as well as be ready for in the moment for one-to-one -one personalization opportunities across every channel. So this question is, um, I would like to uh, uh, highlight, I, I would like uh, Dan to actually answer is, how does your organization kept up with the increase in consumer expectation across all your different touch points? If Dan could uh, take over this question. I think it's very, it has become established already that the experience that we need to deliver to our customers should be number one, comprehensive. Second one, it should be individualized. And lastly, it should also be contextualized. So I, I think the behaviors were just magnified by the pandemic, particularly around uh, certain behaviors in life insurance. But we all know that uh, life insurance has a human element to it. And we found out that the most satisfied customers use both our branches and our digital channels to conduct transactions with us. And we also found out 
that the least satisfied are those who have a digital only relationship with us. So we started magnifying and capitalizing on this insight by transforming our branches. So the question that we wanted to pose is that, uh, how do we now make the branch part of the digital experience of our customers rather than thinking of digital as an extension of the branch? Because basically everyone will start digitally. And then eventually if digital can't handle it, they will eventually go to the branch. So, and some perceptions are here to stay in life insurance. Number one, it is still seen as a negative interaction because you talk about death, you interview, are being interviewed for uh, what are your existing illnesses. And it's really intangible currently and it's long-term. So we want to shift the perception to make it more simple, tangible, positive, and immediate to our customers. And we're starting off with our branches because really life insurance requires a human touch in terms of interacting with our customers. So we are capitalizing on this insight to make sure that the branches become also a revenue generating arm for the company rather than just a cost center. So that's one of the key insights that we wanted to share with everyone here. Another behavior that we're seeing right now is that compared to three years ago, value for money is now the top uh, consumer priority today. So consumers now are demanding that us insurers deliver value for the money that they have spent. And lastly, uh, I think this is very important when we talk about personalization and uh, data privacy. Uh, consumers, while consumers are very, have very low trust today because of the existing uh, data protection and privacy concerns, they are willing to share the information uh, because they also wanted to have a personalized engagement with you. So we found out that almost more than 60% of our customers are interested in products that are tied up to premiums to their healthy lifestyles. So we reward them. We, we are exploring this route of rewarding them on modifying their premiums based on how healthy their lifestyle is. And that's really the core of creating loyalty towards your customers when you involve them in the co-creation of your processes and products. Oh, okay. That's very forward-proofing your business. Thank you for sharing that. I like um, you're saying premium link to the lifestyle. Exactly. So with the pandemic also, like I started earlier, the lifestyle change, the radical lifestyle shifts, right? Customers are taking stock of what is important in their life, right? And then a lot of people are like, that's because of that also there's this great uh, resignation in the US and probably the rest of the world as well and trying to take stock what they want to do next, right? So, so that they'll be more purposeful in their, um, in their life going forward. And I, I like that you mentioned that the, uh, the blend of omni-channel journey, the blend between the digital and offline experience, that needs to be uh, seamless in terms of uh, how you engage the consumer at your touch point as well as digital. Yeah, thank you for sharing that then. Um, can I extend that? How has that influenced your marketing strategies, for example? Maybe I can push the question to uh, Michael, Michelle, sorry, Michelle. <laughs> How okay. has uh, the shift uh, uh, influenced your marketing strategies? Yeah, you know, from my point of view, I feel like so much of what marketing tries to do is articulate problems to customers that resonate um, and really help them understand, right, how to solve the, the challenges. And so while well, it can be really hard is um, verifying when, when sentiment changes so rapidly, like what's actually resonating. And so some of the things that, um, you know, you mentioned empathy, I feel it's really important. Um, there's a lot of things that I've done internally at our own organization. I've seen others too, where, where I have, um, we call them empathy hours. And so uh, a lot of the, the employees, but also marketing, we make sure that people spend time uh, really learning the different um, audiences and making sure that our customers and our future customers, that they really kind of understand their needs. We share them in our all, all hands. Um, and we, we've moved towards a lot of patterns where 
Um, when we write different messages, when we write down and articulate the problems, we actually get feedback first from, um, from different people. And we kind of see, does this make sense to you? You know, how would you phrase that in different words? And, and um, it's been really helpful, especially, you know, today, a, a lot of consumers expect companies to have a voice in a lot of um, things that are going on in the world. And it's really hard to understand um, the sentiment around that. And, and it feels like it can be really tricky for marketing sometimes. And so, you know, a lot of times you, in marketing, you, you kind of test and market, you know, and then, um, but that can be a little risky. And so some of the things that we've done, but also I've seen a lot of our customers is like, um, start taking some of these messages a lot earlier and really run them past different audiences beforehand quickly. And then that way you can really start um, getting at least a feel for how the market will react before you, you kind of push it out online. Okay. So like really uh, doing like, like some sort of a ethnographic research or, or a consumer uh, research, which is more in-depth, right? Before you actually roll out anything online. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's because we're spoiled with our solution, but like, because um, studies can feel really long, but when you're in market, you're trying to pivot quickly. Um, right. And so some of the things that we do is, is you can kind of get feedback in the same day. So it's more of just trying to test and get kind of quick feedback. Right. And does this resonate? Is this kind of making sense? And, and you can start asking questions around like, you know, what are your expectations? And we, we've created like templates for other companies too, because they've really felt like they they get kind of blindsided um, and they're not quite sure how, um, you know, different groups of people are going to react. And so it's a part of, you know, instead of a long kind of study, it's really become more of a process, like while they're building it, kind of getting feedback along the way. So very much in agile way of working, right? You get the feedback, yeah. you reiterate, do it and test and- Totally, yeah, agile right. like- Customer learnings, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay, <laughs> that's great. Um, also, that dovetails us to uh, the next uh, subject, actually. Uh, but before that, uh, I will probably want to throw one last question to Sonali. Um, um, as the consumer interaction move more and more towards digital, how do you ensure you enable and optimize the customer digital experience journey with your business? Maybe Sonali can share her viewpoint on this. Sonali? Oh, oh, okay. So um, I think Sonali was not able to join us. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. No worries. Um, I think uh, uh, I would like to move on to the next part. I mean, you've, you've clearly mentioned the customer research needs to be ongoing and needs to be agile. So a lot of organization, for example, within uh, Domino's organization, also we look at customer voice uh, very actively. We track the net promoter score. We use net promoter score as well as CSAT. So we, uh, we measure the net promoter score uh, on all our touch points. So, um, and not just in terms of measurement, uh, the thing with, um, net promoter score, it can become just as a KPI thing. You know, you can just measure it and it's, it's just a number to be measured and to be reported to management, whether we go up or down. But that's not the whole crux of implementation of net promoter score. The whole crux of net promoter score is to get the actual verbal teams from the customer and actually deal down on those insights. I mean, what can we gather from those insights, right? And what are the insights used for? The insights are then used for improvement in terms of process improvement on the business or in terms of uh, marketing uh, uh, adaptation based on customer feedback, like you rightly say so earlier. It's like when you uh, co-create with a customer, I think this was highlighted by then, when you co-create with the customer to actually come up, for example, premium that is linked to the lifestyle of the healthy lifestyle of the customer. So you're actually addressing the customer need without they even voicing it out, right? So these are some of the nuggets or the insights that we should be getting from either consumer research such as a company such as yourself Michelle or it could be already already ingrained in your organization through net promoter score the uh, CSAT and whatever other channels that you want to gather the feedback from yeah I uh, Kaushik put your hand out I would like yes. to hear what you I think, think it's, of it. it's yeah. a very very interesting observation I just need to highlight one very important thing in very mm -hmm. recent past what we had done we had introduced a concept known as continuum of care. 
so continuum of care what we felt when a patient gets discharged from the hospital he completely gets disconnected from the hospital and it was one problem that we had with lot of our patients who told us this in the voice of the customer so we started a premium queue which is known as your continuum of care every patient who gets discharged from the hospital whether it is surgical non surgical patient gets a call from my queue asking how is he feeling now is he taking his medicines on time and can we help him to fix an appointment with the doctor for his coming for his routine checkup so when we started doing this see initially when you put a plan the first thing that people will ask you the board will ask you why do i need to have this four people because today is a pandemic time do we really need to invest in this four people whose job is primarily calling even without a target right but when we started doing this what it's what how it started helping us lot of this customer started saying that you are the first one doing this in the market in healthcare nobody does this they started going to the google and posting this so it became so popular then we started saying okay we are calling ip patients the numbers are less why can't we extend this to our op patients so obviously because of the huge footfall that we had we could not call all op patients we started calling at least 1000 patients every month from every hospital and clinic because of this everybody started appreciating of the fact see one part is measuring nps the second part what we started doing because in number own take us anyway you want to move from 9 your nps is 65 but what how can 65 become 75 so we started speaking to customers and believe me customers gave us a lot of competition information which we could have otherwise paid huge money to the marketing survey companies so if you listen to your customers really well and you make an attempt that if you have committed a mistake genuinely apologize we have gone wrong we cannot reverse it but to ensure that it will not impact other patients please tell us give us an opportunity to serve you better next time so unfortunately in healthcare uh, uh, you know you cannot have a loyalty program come one buy one get one free you <laughs> cannot so and healthcare and that's the reason i call it very very complex industry and the only way that you really get your market share is through your great service is through your word of mouth through your 10 km radius your serving of community because a lot of marketing campaigns that work for other industries does not really work for healthcare and that is why i say in healthcare service plays such a critical role whether it is doctor whether it is nurses whether it is reception so just wanted to add up to whatever you said in terms of nps and how do we use the data to drive more and more customer uh, positivity or customer mindset behaviors again yeah that that's a very interesting insight from your side harshit thank you for sharing that you're right i mean especially for a uh, uh, companies such as yourself or uh, hospitals right i mean uh, as a consumer what is the most important thing when i look for a hospital it's regarding health it's all about the trust right the trust of the brand the trust of the service because i'm not going to uh, mess around with my health or my children's health i want the best for my children's health or even my health right so i it's it boils down to then the whole experience the trust that you have with that organization whether the doctors there is trustworthy and the service is trustworthy and it follows through so yeah that that's that boils down to the importance of medical healthcare yeah fact, thank you for sharing that perspective yeah fact, just to one last one point that i want to add on trust mm-hmm. in our entire voc we just added one more template what brought you to medcare and believe me yeah. what we started seeing that the brand trust the moment it becomes higher you get a better proportion of your nps score the moment the trust factor increases trust and transparency are the two key pillars of healthcare i think for the industry correct true true very much agree with you i can second that yeah thank you so now we have a uh, kind of dovetail to our last topic of the discussion uh, basically in terms of the value of analytics so like we were talking analytics can come from the consumer research part or it can come from the mps that we track or csat service that we ask our customers how our service is doing at every interaction so all that is be measured to the real value of analytics is measured to revenue to drive revenue increase right to drive customer retention and to also prospect conversion so how to develop complete views across digital and omni channel customer journey shared democratically with all business unit that will enable 
any organization to drive real-time insights to improve customer engagement, to improve customer conversion, and also to improve overall customer lifetime value for the brand. So with that, can I pose the question to Davy next? Um, how have your industry or company leveraged on voice of customer data to develop a deeper understanding and empathy for customer, especially post-COVID era? Okay, thanks for that. I know. Um, basically, in Tokopedia, we have a closed loop mechanism. So, starting with customer insights, similar to Domino's, probably. We, we gather CSAP, NPS, customer tickets to understand what customer really needs. And then uh, it becomes an improvement initiative from product tech and business team. Then there's a testing to check whether the feature is okay or not by rolling out the feature first to a small percentage of customers. If it works, then we'll roll it out to more users. Um, after the features launch, then we gather the feedback again, and then it'll become improvement. So it just happens continuously. But I think what's more important than that is uh, for the team to develop empathy for the customers. I think this is something unique to our company, uh, where we really have a strong culture. So um, focus on consumers is actually one of the company three DNAs. So since day one, uh, customer service has always been the most important parts of the company. Even when the size, the number of employees was just four in the first few years, um, there's also already a, a customer service agent there. Um, and today when we have scaled to like thousands of employees where, um, yeah, it, we actually call them Nakama. Um, we, get everybody, not just customer service, everybody needs to solve customer problems. So for example, we have a program where like say a team who built a customer registration process, they may have feel that they've done their best and used the most advanced technology, but they'll be surprised when they look at the customer complaints, apparently they still don't know how to register to our platform. So this is a, one example of programs where customer can really, uh, uh, sorry, our employee can really feel what the customer is uh, feeling or experiencing. Um, commitment from top leaders is also there. Uh, like even our CEO sometimes still looks at complaints and he will react and resolve them. He'll follow up with our product and tech team and ensure it's not happening again. So um, I think that support from top leaders uh, from the top to the bottom, everybody's really customer focused. So it's really reflecting in all the decision made in the company as well. So um, that experience will also, uh, customer will also feel it, right? Yes, definitely. It will be felt at the end of the value chain, right? Whatever the business does and the upstream will be felt that the downstream, that's what we hope. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned about um, the people, the culture, a very strong culture that, that it starts off with the people in the organization, right? It starts off with defining the right culture or the right mindset within the organization to be customer centric, to be customer obsessed. So it, it, it boils down to the pub. Uh, the culture, right? Like the saying says that, uh, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? So it's important that the culture of the people needs to be towards that, the culture, customer centric mindset. So one of the things that we in uh, Domino's also focuses on that is the inculcating the culture centric mindset within across, not just at our frontliners, meaning not just our outlets or even our contact center, but throughout the organization, basically, because um, for example, in HR, uh, the, the client for HR within the organization is the employees. So, so they need to enable a, a culture-centric mindset to be able to serve the employees of the organization better. So it's, you know, there's always a client for everybody. Internal client is internal customers. Uh, external is, of course, our end consumers, right? So that, that, I'm glad you brought up the issue on the culture. And then 
Um, also, in terms of, uh, I just share a little bit, in Domino's also, we, we are very into the getting the insights of the customer from VOC. And then from those insights, we enable the inner closed loop, which is actually close the loop with the customer as a day-to-day -day operations at the contact center or even at the uh, outlet, as well as uh, looking at the outer closed loop. Outer closed loop framework is when we require um, a, a systemic change to the whole process. So for example, it requires a systemic change in terms of IT, in terms of marketing, or in terms of um, uh, operations, right? So for those kind of systemic change, it's not something that we can handle within the, the immediate term, but it is something that we need to put in place as a business process improvement, that we need to run it as a project so that whatever the current issues will be handled at the root cause instead of addressing just the symptoms, you know? So those are some of the initiatives that we are focusing on from the FMB industry perspective. Okay, um, with that, I have one last question that I would like to, uh, looking at the time, I'd like to ask, um, uh, maybe I pose this question to Dan. Um, what are the key CX transformation program that your company is currently undergoing or have in plans? If Dan oh, yeah. could pick up that issue, yeah, that question, yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yes. I think yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, for for the sake of time, uh, I will not go through everything. But I think knowing what we already know today about our customers in the life insurance sector, uh, the question that we posed our, to ourselves was, how do we now reinvent our, ourselves to become the carrier of the future? So three things that led us to this uh, strategy that we want to implement uh, moving forward. Number one, how do we transform today's protect and restore proposition of our company? So the mindset there is that we need to protect holistically across a broad range of interests of our customers. So what we found out that customers' interests are what should be insured and not just assets. And we're repositioning our core pro value proposition uh, by focusing around the customer intent rather than a set of bundled products. And another thing to add there is that we want to re also restore the customer after a loss in ways that extend beyond indemnity. So they're not just looking for financial value, but also emotional value. So we're veering away, we're, we're enhancing and moving away from the traditional insurance value proposition. The second one is expanding our value proposition because all too often policies are seen as an obligation today. So the challenge is how do you make it more engaging for your customers? So this is where personalization comes in. And then we also wanted to prevent loss with the customer. So rather than anticipate, rather than waiting for the loss to happen, we want to be them to be part of the prevention side. And lastly, how do we now add new value added services? So we're looking at ecosystem partners. I like what Debbie mentioned that everyone in the organization are into improving customer experience because that's really the essence of the ecosystem of the customer's experience. Regardless of your role, you have a say. If you are in finance, IT, you have a say to the customer's experience, experience even if you are the CEO and CEO. So eventually, all of these three things in life and in our industry, we wanted, we really wanted to focus on improving our value proposition by partnering with uh, other partners and also increasing, uh, enhancing our current business models. Okay, great, great. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things happening <laughs> on your part there. I, I can see that the whole transformation uh, have started like uh, a few years back, right? Uh, 20, you mentioned, uh, when, when did it start? the whole CX transformation in the organization? Three years ago. Three years ago, yeah, okay. Years ago. And you've come very far from since three years ago, I'm sure. All right. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's good. So maybe um, uh, with that, um, I'm not sure how are we for time. I think, do we have any more time, Shruti, or uh, we, we should go for closing now? I think we can close, Ainul. Okay. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. First and foremost, thank you so much uh, to my esteemed uh, panel speakers. Uh, you have shared a lot of insights in terms of how you have taken the voice of the customer and how you have 
actually operationalize that within your respective company or your respective industry. I'm enlightened to see a lot of um, um, uh, good work that is coming, especially from the healthcare sector that Kaushi has shared, uh, that is very much, um, uh, in, it shows empathy from the business side of things towards the consumer. And then on Dan's side as well, on the insurance perspective, and of course, on uh, the Davy's side, on how uh, she has evolved the digital touch point at Tokopedia and how has that evolved. And I have seen um, uh, the LinkedIn updates on uh, Tokopedia. You guys are very active in terms of um, democratizing the whole e-commerce or marketplace for Indonesia, which is which is a great agenda, national agenda as itself, right? So uh, kudos to you uh, and Tokopedia, Devi. And uh, thanks also, uh, Michelle, for sharing her perspective in terms of consumer research, in terms of um, uh, taking heed of uh, customer feedback in the nick of time, in a way, so to address it in an agile way of working rather than, you know, spending months and months on... Uh, a survey that you know by the time you analyze the insights it will be past <laughs> past the, the the impactful uh, uh window right so uh that's all great insight from all the panel speakers and uh i guess last words from myself um going forward um any industry we should look at uh looking at cx transformation listening through our customer understanding their whole end-to-end -end journey or experience with us as uh, as our business when they interact with us as a business end-to-end -end journey meaning from the point of awareness all the way to them um, sharing their experience from us because right now everything is on social media whatever the interaction they go with the business they will be able to share it whether it negative or positive experiences. So with that, um, I thank you, uh, all the panel speakers, uh, for taking the time today of your busy schedule to share your insight and thoughts. And over to you, Shruti. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ainul, for that great moderation. And uh, thanks for all the panelists for an insightful and thought-provoking session.